Let's try to get out of the water. No, I'm sorry. Well, maybe not just like this one. Yeah. All right. How many, how many of y'all ate the yellow duck pancakes? There you go. Yellow duck. Wait a minute. Is it yellow duck or is it bitter duck? Bitter duck? What do you think? I think it's bitter duck. Because ah. of the red. Because look at me there. See that red mid vein? Indicative of bitter duck. Yellow dock will occasionally get one in the hot summer. Since you said it, have a bite. <laughs> Let's see if it's bitter. Wait a minute, that is bitter. Oh, yeah. I want to try it. No, more sour. The dock? He said he wants some. <laughs> bitter dock. No, sour, San bitter. Sandy bitter dock. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? That is a garden plant gone wild. <laughs> what are these? Well, give me a chance. I'll lead. I'll, I'll identify. It. Hang on. All right. Flea bay. What kind of flea bay? Daisy. Philadelphia. How do you know? Daisy, yes. Is it Philadelphia? It is Daisy Fleabane. Daisy. Daisy Fleabane. Doesn't matter, either one, they both work the same. They're both like two types of peaches. These plants got named Fleabane because of one of two things. You either put them in the bed where your dogs lay to get rid of fleas, or people thought they attracted fleas. <laughs> Usually the Fleabane, so they would put them in, in because they have a lot of oils in them that fleas do not like. So we use it as repellents. Um, one of the famous flea banes is Canada flea bane. Also known, and now they got, it was original, I'm Caniza canadensis, which is a tall horsetail flea bane that we've got. And it was um, one of the flea banes that was famous in the 1800s for tissus. You ever heard of tissus? As opposed to ptosis. Tissus, P-H-T-I-S-I-S, -I -I -S, is the sputum white and frothy that comes up from the lungs from a condition called tuberculosis. And it was used to dry up the lungs and stop all that. That's sputum. Guys, quiet or move on. Anywho, um, and they made what was called oil of origeron from it, though actually it was just a saturated tincture. And for some reason they called it an oil. But it was really good. In fact, they called uh, tuberculosis at that time the White Death because of all the white frothy sputum. Occasionally, you would see it in Europe called the King's Evil. Several diseases actually got called the King's Evil, and it was called that because the king had it. No, nope. if you were the king, since you were almost <coughs> a deity, you touched somebody, it would cure them. So if they had tuberculosis and the king touched them, they would be cured of the tuberculosis. That was the thought. Interesting, I've got a, a I collect antique, eclectic medical books. I got a, probably one of the largest collections in the country. And I've got one book that's the only copy in existence because it's handwritten. And there was a, a, an eclectic physician in the 1800s, very famous. I've got every one of his books that I can get called John M. Scudder. His son, when he was 16, was teaching at the Eclectic Medical College up north, uh, what, Philadelphia or somewhere, and, no, Cincinnati. And he hand wrote a book called A Treatise on the Eye, Ears, Nose, and Throat. And it's a handwritten treatise. I thought, boy, if I wrote a handwritten treatise, you wouldn't be able to read it. You can just take a scratch. The most beautiful writing. And the guy, and he was like 16, he taught there for several years. Then he came down with the White Death in the early 1900s. Was my 20 something years old died from it, mm -hmm. and it was quite common to die. In fact, I remember up through the 80s, you still had common have TB sanitariums in existence. Is it still uh, common today or no? Not as common yeah. because more easily treated by antibiotics. Although tuberculosis is out there, it's not as uncommon as you think. And uh, there's still one now, it's a mental health center in Gadsden that was a TB sanitarium for years. 
So how would you use these? These are best that? used. Now remember, if when I talk about Southern folk medicine and everything was a tea, these are actually best made as a tincture. And what they would call a saturated or concentrated tincture. The whole plant? The, the whole, whole plant. Arrow. Leaves, flowers, every bit of it. You could technically use the roots, but mm, not necessarily. Just all the above ground aerial parts. Okay. So, would you use PGA or vodka before? Well, their determination factor in what alcohol percentage you use, and this is, I'm going to give you a, a, a generic thing. If it's a fresh plant, PGA. If it's a green plant, fresh, like because of the liquid in it, it's pure green alcohol because that makes up for the water content. If you did vodka and it was a juicy thing like a tomato, that's 90% water. You're already diluting it down so much, you make it below the level of concentration, uh, efficacy, and preservation. If it's an oily plant, a resinous plant, like, like plum jelly, you know, the, the gel that comes out, cherry, etc., PGA, because it takes the pure grain alcohol to break the bonds, the molecular bonds down. If it's dry, generally speaking, then you can go to a, a lower proof alcohol such as vodka. Okay. There are except, a lot of exceptions, but that's the general rule. And then if you're doing things like some of the medicinal mushrooms like chaga, reishi, etc., then you're doing a double extract to get the water soluble contents and you start with PGA. Um, I ran into a midwife that said that they had Did switched. Did you hurt her? Didn't hurt her. Okay. Uh -uh, she was very resilient. <laughs> but she told me, for me running into her, that they started using flea bane to stop hemorrhaging. That it was yes, their number because, one for it. Because a plant that starts, well, it's, it's like this. If a plant, if you're using a plant for the sinuses to stop drainage, it's stopping fluid, right? It doesn't care where the fluid's located. It'll, start, it'll slow up menstrual flow, it'll slow up diarrhea a lot of times, it'll slow up nasal running, and the flip side, it, if it causes flow, it can cause it, and that's why they're doing that. Because it, it was the cat's meow for the lung issues, and, they, and then they extrapolated on out to other flow. And also for sinus and running sinus? Yeah, but it would not be my first choice. Like that sinus thing I taught you, that's the, what I love for it. Because I know lots of things that will do something, but it doesn't mean it's your first choice. I'm sorry, my name is Hay. Hey. Hey, Daryl. Can we use a generator plant? We want to, I'm going to move it indoors. It's just, it's just going to be easier. It's going to be cold. People okay. don't want it. It's going to be dark. I'm trying to get down in there. Somebody's going to fall. We could, but I, I decided to be ready or not. All right. The band at seven. Yes, the, the the pickers and grinders are at six. That that is Jonathan's kid. Sarah, before we move on from the flea bane, is that okay to use? Is just a tea in general because I happen to love the smell. Of yeah, the flea if you went to any traditional Southern folk herbalist, they didn't do tinctures. Yeah. Everything was a tea. Yeah, I mean I just I like the tea. Huh? Is that tea? It smells like flowers. Yeah, it's wonderful. Is it tasty? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, Try that it. is. Oh, is that Creeping Charlie? Creeping Charlie. Charlie, also known as? Ground Ivy. Anybody know the botanical name? No. Extra points. Glachoma heraceae. All right, what do you remember whoever heard me speak yesterday what it was used for? Maybe we need to go by the ginkgo tree. Get the memory herb. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Hold that. Just don't touch. Um, <laughs> 1800s, you had Mad Hatter's disease. Painter's colic, both which arose from the processes of making felted hats or paint using lead, mercury, heavy metals. They would take ground this ground ivy, hot as you could stand it, drink it, sweat lodge, sauna, heavy blankets, something to make you also sweat, and that would chelate those metals out of your body. So it was good for that, or if you had syphilis. It would get rid of syphilis. You make a tea. Always has a hot tea, or could you? Oh, no, you, it's you've got to sweat because where are those chelated metals going to come out? Pores. pores. Through your yeah. pores, and it's some sweaty because it opens the skin, op vasodilates, and it gets rid. Helps to get rid of those heavy metals. It is the it's the plant of choice, that along with uh, cilantro, or. <laughs> I love 
heavy metal detoxing? Huh? For heavy metal detoxing? Mm -hmm. What? Cilantro? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. As a tea? Uh, tea, this tea, but hot can and we, sweat. Does it have to be Don't hot? do Those any, if you're going to do anything to get rid of heavy metals, body, you got to sweat. Okay. A hot it's ineffective. Tea. Uh huh. And then a sweat lodge, a sauna, heating, bla heating blankets. You got to heat your body to open your pores. But you could use it with hot peppers to get that. Not, it, you can, but it's still not the same. It's just it's not, not the way because you want to heat your entire body from your core okay. out. What about a hot bath with that? Yes. Okay. A hot, hot, it's still, but it's hot. it's it's to this side of going to the ER for a burn. Mm -hmm. As okay. hot as you can get your body to sweat. You got two different ways you sweat. One with her, one's called a diaphoretic, makes you sweat gangbusters. A sudorific, um, sassafras uh, roots is sudorific with most people, makes you sweat so hard it beads up on your forehead. It gets like sticky beads. That's even stronger. A lot of people they intermix them, but there's a difference. You want to have a sudorific effect. How do you, more than, how do you use sassafras for a sudorific? As a tea. Drink it as a tea. Root bark or what? Only the root bark. Can I throw this away now? What do you want to No. You go to the top. I don't want to go around. Okay. How many have ever done this? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. I've thought about it. Not yet. Just run and jump. <laughs> All right. When I first started working with herbs back in 1884 or 1984, whichever, I used to catch poison ivy every time I went out the woods. Digging fox sets in the wintertime, I'd get in the roots, digging herbs. Finally, I went to Tommy Bass and I said, Tommy, I can't take it no more. What do you do to either treat it or stop it? And he said, well, son, go get you some uh, leaves from the size of a mouse's ear. Put them in a pinch of bread. Don't touch your lips. Now, you told me that. I said, sure. Now what do you do? I trusted Tommy Bass. <laughs> that time I, I, he walked on water. So I went out to the poison ivy tree, my little loaf of white bread, my heart pounding. I thought, I'm going to die of a coronary before I even die of poison ivy. <laughs> Didn't kill me. Two days later, did it again. Didn't kill me. And started doing it every year. Now, now I've reached a point where I take a little leaf with it. Just eat it. Do you have to do it when it first starts growing? That's when you do it, when they're that size, when they're tiny. tiny. So, Sometimes I'll just pinch the tip off of one. Well, you can. I'm, I was going to get to that. <laughs> so could if I, I don't Emily? see a little one. Yeah. You know, you, you can cheat and just take the tip off. off. Yeah. You can actually make tinctures and take a drop of the tincture. Oh, if you right. want to. Drop as in? A drop. Like, like drop. micro dosing? One drop. That'd so be... could you like wrap it in a leaf? Well, here's what you want to do. Get your pair of tweezers. Pinch them off with the tweezers. Put them in gelatin capsules. Cover them back up, mouth, close them back up, let them sit for about two days because they will warp with the moisture in it. Then the, then the capsule will dry back out, and then every couple of days just pop a capsule, about two weeks. What I do, most of the time I just eat them in classes and that, that way I keep it in me. When I was doing it in capsules, I just put them in capsules, put them in my truck. And just take one every time I got my truck in the morning, because I I couldn't remember did I take it yesterday or two days ago or whatever, and then I just take them till I got I forgot. Now I've reached a point where some years I do, some years I don't. Most years, if I teach a class, and it's not one leaf. This is three leaflets. You want the three little leaflets when they're tiny. These are too big, so I do one leaf. I did that. But these little ones here, you just pinch off those three. It, and it'll give you about a year's worth of immunity. Some people get a couple years, and the more years you do it, the longer that immunity works. Um, in, what, 39 years of telling people about this now, 
I've only had a couple people had rectal itching as a result of it. I did not examine it. I took their word for it. But it's very good, and they'll give you immunity to poison oak, which we don't have here, thank you, Wes. And poison sumac, because it's all arushi, all. Same, same, same poison. No side same effects? Huh? No side effects if you have like a sensitive stomach or anything? I've never had anybody have a problem. It actually has a really pleasant taste. I can see why it's um, like it so much. It's not bitter. You no, know, unless you got milk goats to drink in their milk. <coughs> you know, I've, I've, this you do on your own. I ain't telling you to do it. I will tell you, I've never had anybody have any issues. What can you think about it? What are you doing? You're taking I've a small dose so. of what you're allergic to. It sounds like a vaccine, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. So could I grab some in a leaf right now and take it? Or would put it, it in, I'd put it in a bread so because you don't want to risk touching, touching your lips, lips or get it on your fingers or something. But. You saw what she just did. I'm sorry, I just Don't picked fall. it. Your, your fingertips are less sensitive. I was, I was really nervous at first. So mm -hmm. I probably did tweezers in a cat. I was scared. Mm -hmm. I'm not scared mm -hmm. anymore. I'm, I'm just thinking if I wrapped it up in a, like a leaf of poison ivy. Leave it. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess you could. Yeah. Would you do it up or just fall? It doesn't have to be a white, loaf of white bread, but that's what you <laughs> need back there. You do. I mean, I chew it up just because it doesn't always just go where I want it to No, go. If, you don't chew, if you don't chew it up, it sticks somewhere. Yeah, like I have uh, to get it, um, unless you have some water with you. I, you know, I was, I was so allergic to poison ivy. When I was seven years old, we lived in San Francisco at the Presidio. My dad was in the military, and they got true western poison oak because it was eight foot tall. And I was picking blackberries in it. I didn't know. I came down with poison oak so bad, I was in intensive care and almost died. Never since then, if it looked like leaves of three, I feed. Did you say this was good? Yeah, about that size. Oh, you're touching it with, you're probably getting your hand all over <laughs> <laughs> it. Well, I did try the raw cap. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite. Can you do the same thing with that? If that makes you welt up and stuff. This makes you welt up. Oh stuff? yeah, it'll actually, it'll actually bleed sometimes. Really? Yeah. It makes you. Oh, we play with that all the I've time. I've never heard of that. Anywho, but yeah, you should be able to. I'm. Okay. Don't see no reason why you can't. Same theory. All right, this is. Leaf also known as. Sticky weed. Sulfur weed. Goosegrass. <laughs> Goosegrass, <laughs> also known as. All I know is gallium. It's a gallium. Gallium. Bed straw. Now, pass it around and feel how square that stem is. This is one of the exceptions to the rule that if a plant has a square stem, it's either a mint or a verbena. It's a gallium. And yet, it is a nervine, just like those are. This is a nervine? Uh-huh. Sure is. You go back to the eclectics, they used it as a nervine. It will also, if you're a veg vegetarian, it'll curdle milk to make <laughs> cheese, a soft curd cheese. It acts yeah, like rennet. Right hmm. Wait, say that again. What did you say? If you're a vegetarian, yeah. you can use this. Like uh, Stinging Nettles does it too. It will curdle milk to make cheese, a, a soft curd cheese. It, it's, a, it's a thermos plant too. Now, a thermos keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. How do it know? It just does. This will act as a drying astringent in your body if you need it. It will act more as a mucilaginous herb if your body needs it. It is a substitute in many cases for chickweed. As the chickweed dies out, the old timers would gather goosegrass for this. During the war between the states, when it was hard to get coffee, the seeds on these were dried and used as a, and parched as a coffee substitute, among other plants. That's a desperate need for coffee because that's a lot of work. But it's a very good liver herb, good kidney and bladder herb as well. And uh, there's a bunch of different galliums. And you also have, oh uh, gosh, what's the one? That, one of them is, a, is a, a dye plant, actually. I'm trying to think which one, the small one it is. But anyway, nice and square. It almost, it almost feels artificial, it's so square. Mm -hmm. 
play with these. Here, I got this smooth one. Stick one each other. This is my nemesis. <laughs> and I have in 39 years I've not manned up and done it. I need to make a medicine out of this. English ivy. About four or five times a year I get a phone call and here's how it goes. I got the worst case of poison ivy, but I wasn't in the poison ivy. And I said, really? And I and immediately know it's obvious. He said, what were you doing? Well, we were working in the yard, weed whacking and stuff. And I said, well, do you have any English ivy in your yard? Yeah, we were weed whacking the English ivy. About 30% of the population, this thing here will eat you alive, and I'm one of them. I learned about this before I got into herbal medicine. <clears throat> I was fixing to go off into basic training in the army and I was cleaning off a hillside. Picked one, well no, that's second one. Just weed whacked a whole ton of the hillside of this. Had it so bad, it, I, all I needed to do was go to Panama City and lay in the ocean for three days. A few years ago, well, probably about 15, a few, about 20 years ago, showing off to some Boy Scouts, I just picked one by the stem dropped it and just happened to mm -hmm. about 50 minutes later and the way you tell the difference is poison ivy looks like what on you pustules this looks like somebody dripped acid on you dry crusty irritated skin and it hurts which is interesting because it's sold as a washing liquid Boy, would that mess you up if you were sensitive to it. But on the flip side, if you dry this, it's one of the best lung and cough medicines in the world that will not break you out. And you see it advertised a lot called ivy syrup or ivy leaf tea. Once it's dried, it's okay. But here's how I, if I want it fresh, I put a hazmat suit on, <laughs> gloves, goggles and then I make Jane do it. <laughs> I will. It eats me alive until it's dried and then it's fine. It makes great lung medicine. If you're I'm not sensitive to it, can you use it fresh it for a tea? I won't hear so. it. I'll grab it okay. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> but probably so because because the people use it for Washing powders, yeah. washing liquid. Make me eat. Just think about that. Now, if you've got some of that growing in pots at home, is it is it the same as this? Could you use it the same way, or would you have to? Use it? As long as it's as long as it's a variation of the English ivy in India, they probably call it Indian ivy because uh, there are different cultivars of this. But yeah, you don't like it. <clears throat> Next to it is another one that can make break you out. Virginia creeper also known as American woodbine because in England there's a woodbine that looks similar. The berries on this, even though considered slightly toxic, were used for fevers in children. About 30% of the population, again, this will break you out. This one doesn't bother me. Um, in the fall, they turn reds and orange and yellows. When they do that, about 60% of the population becomes allergic to it. So, Virginia, Virginia creeper. creeper. You, see, you always tell it. How many leaves does it have? Five. Five. No, one. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. That's the trick. Yep. Five leaflets. As opposed to how many leaves does poison ivy have? One. 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 <laughs> Three leaflets. And how many does English ivy have? One. Don't know, don't care. <laughs> yeah. But if you're allergic to poison ivy and you're not allergic to this, this is a good wash for poison ivy. Oh, that's good. To know. If you're allergic to this, poison ivy is not a good wash for it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, be careful with is it. Is there anything like I have so much of that? You know, we just kept try to. Can you use it for anything besides? Yeah. So what the, can I do? What, you, what can I do with it? It basically was used for fevers. It didn't that's have a it. whole lot of uses that were that were used a lot. Okay. Sometimes you use the vines as cordage. Yeah. Okay, how about this? Box elder. People think that's a poison ivy, it's got three leaflets. 
Y'all all hitting in the right neighborhood. Box elder, maple. Box elder, which is actually the only compound leaf maple tree we have. And you can actually, this is a fast growing, short lived tree, but they can get really big. And um, uh, you can tap it like you do any maple. If you look behind you, well, we'll go back. What does that tree look like behind you? Not this one, the one next to it. To the right. Jugulus nigra? Hmm? Jugulus nigra? Which would be? Black walnut. Black walnut. That one, that one. Black walnut. Black walnut. Black walnut. Black walnut. All three of these trees are black walnuts. Okay. I have black walnuts. They're just very tall. If you want something really, really, really tasty, find a black walnut tree that's sort of low to the ground that you can get the nuts off of. When they first come out, they're like about that big. As long as they're soft enough to shove a toothpick through, you can do this. You take them, brine them for 24 hours, rinse them off, then pickle them. They're wonderful. You, will end, you will end up with what looks like squid ink, mm. and it'll taste like A1 steak sauce if you do it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does. You think you're eating A1 steak sauce. So brine for 24 the, hours? Yeah. I brine mine for 24 well, hours, rinse them real well, green. and okay. then pickle them. Okay. And in Italy, you make nocino with them, which like is a, a thing, right? liqueur. Mm -hmm. If you want to get real fancy, you can take them and chop, when they're small, chop them up into a, a lot of small pieces, pickle that, and make relish. It's like steak relish. It's really, really good. Are we talking about the leaves? No, the nuts. The nuts. When, they're, when they're very little, before that, the nut inside the husk gets hard, you can shove a toothpick right through it. It's still soft. Okay. That's when you just... Chop it up, you know. Husk go ahead, brine them, chop them up, pickle them. So the husk and everything, right? Huh? The husk, too, the husk is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so would a that lot of be flavor. a good warmer? Would you have the same benefits as when? It's yeah, you could eat your steak on? and get warm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it would be because you're getting the green husk, so it would be a warmer. But it's, but it's, it doesn't affect the bowel making you hurt or anything. It's absolutely delicious on grilled meat. Um, we use it on our charcuterie board, blue cheese and on a cracker. It's just delicious. I mean, it's something that you have to get over the aesthetics of what it looks like for some people at first, and then you taste it. You go, Crap, this is good stuff. And I'll, um, then the husk, the green husk, is your is your antifungal, your wormer, etc. Interestingly, in the this this is pretty funny. I think or not funny, funny. It's strange. In the 1800s, cancer was considered a parasite and they treated it with antifungals. Have you noticed what off-the-label medicines for COVID seem to be the most effective? Antifungals, antiparasiticals. And walnuts, one of the ones you can use in those formulas. Anybody ever eat a day lily? I eat the flowers. Oh, but I've not eaten the roots yet. I didn't know you could eat the leaves Huh? I didn't know you could eat the leaves That's yesterday. Well, you don't eat the leaves. They'll lock you up. Okay. You eat the buds, the flowers, and the, t the tubers that it puts out on there. And tubers are only about that big, but you get a good batch, they'll put... I don't know if you... She was nobody, saying that nobody was here. I'm gonna have to get my shovel. I've got a knife I use for digging in the ground if you want it. Yeah, usually I use mine, but I got people ratting me out for using it. Well, it's not very big, things. but it's great for harvesting bamboo and such. But... You need a big one. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that same knife. If I had that on my pants, I could keep them up. <laughs> <laughs> Crap, the tooth tip broke. There you go. See all the little tubers there? Think of those as little Jerusalem artichokes. Mm -hmm. I'll pass it around. Well, speaking of Jerusalem artichokes, what does it look like, Berlin? Uh, 
Think of any sunflower. Uh, if you decide you want to see some by the end of the weekend, come over to my property. I've got about six varieties growing. When do they bloom? Summer. Now? Summer? Oh no, they're only about that big right now. I got white varieties, red varieties, you name it, salty, sweet, starchy. Uh, Jerusalem artichoke is one of the best survival foods out there to grow. If for no other reason than the fact, as Conehead said, makes mass quantities. You get lots of it, it's native, it will spread, and if you rototill it up, you've just spread it. Uh, and the native, what you get in the store are called sun chokes. Those are a sterile hybrid. Every once in a while, they'll, they'll make seed. The wild ones will make viable seed. As long as there are a couple of varieties near each other to cross pollinate, especially. Um, I've got a bunch of Drew's Martoks in my yard, Gadsden, and every one of them came from bird seed because it was all heart milled out in the Midwest where mm -hmm. it, grows, it grows wild everywhere. It grows in Alabama, and it's a little hard to find much of it. Tennessee, you find more of it, but um, I've just got beds of it because it's such a beautiful flower out in our meadow, and, and it's just it's pure food. A little gassy, but you know that could be fixed with fermenting well, I had, and stuff. Uh, this plant that grows everywhere in my, my space, and I, good, you know, I, I tried to identify it. It's a Jerusalem artichoke, but I don't have much of a root. No, because it Jerusalem artichoke's a sunflower. Yeah, it's there like six feet tall. There of sunflowers out there, and there's some tall. Uh, I've got one out there right now, small. It's called a hairy sunflower, and it won't make any edible tubers, but it'll get that okay, tall. Wow. So. You know, Jerusalem artichoke is the sunflower that makes the tubers. They and they do the tubers really at the expense of seed, viable seed. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you can't beat them. I mean, you got something you can pickle, boil, mash, fry, you name it. You, you can do it with Jerusalem artichokes. Mm -hmm. And what's even nicer is if the zombies come through, they have no clue that it's edible. <laughs> <laughs> is this Jerusalem artichoke growing under here? No. No. Mm. What is it? I don't know, I didn't look at it. Absolutely fresh. That is a lethal green plant. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go this way. Okay. Now, maybe this afternoon I'll get it, but catch me later. At some point this weekend, I'm going to have the poison hemlock. So, what do you think this is? Is it? Queen. No, Queen Anne's Anne's lace, lace, but I wouldn't like touch. I wouldn't okay. touch with it now. But I think it's, it's hairy. Got a huh? So it's hairy. It's it not is hemlock. hairy. It can't be hemlock because it's hairy, right? And there's right. no purple, but it's now, still young. Now I'll tell you this: Queen Anne's lace can get some purple streaks yeah. in it. Yeah. But who's got a good sniffer? I do. Carrots. Can really smell it? Ever carrots. Oh. Then can it be poison hemlock? No. no. Okay, that's the first time I actually ever smelled carrots. It'll smell it. You think you go to well, an organic grocery store and, for carrots and you buy oh, carrots yeah. that still have the carrot tops on them? Yeah. They'll smell like carrots. Mm -hmm. You know why? It's a carrot. <laughs> that's a carrot. Yes, they do. Now, medicinally, <laughs> what is it not good for? It's a powerful diuretic. In fact, the old. Be careful. Because my touch, that's that one's actually dead, hand. yeah. Oh, wow. Um, there's an old saying that Queen Anne's lace will make you piss like a Russian racehorse. <laughs> I was like, why are they saying that? Until I find out the Russians were big cheats at horse racing. Then they would dose their horses up with Lasix afterwards to pee out all of the drugs they put in them. Queen Anne's lace will flow through you. If you've got gout, it not only dissolves the uric acid crystals, it flushes them out of your system. Lick fast as anything plant cherry or whatever you want to use I've ever seen take a couple or three days as however a huh as it's you got to drink it as tea you want lots of tea you think well I'm putting lots of fluid in me now it's gonna make the fluid worse no it pushes it on through um, diuretic gout which is a type of arthritis by the way if you didn't know um, weight loss pulls out water weight for people who need to lose water weight it's a great edible plant. The flowers, you can dip them in pancake batter and make fritters that are just super, <coughs> super good. If you make syrup or jelly with it, it'll be pink. 
because that one little maroon flower that's not in every head but in most of them that one little thing it's got a lot of uh, probably anthocyanins in it and it'll make your jelly pink and taste really it tastes really good would you do that like you would do a red bud jelly or something where you make a tea from the flower yes okay yeah you just you just boil them or steam them and then just add your water and sugar okay. it makes a really nice tasting jelly but they're really good as pancakes little fritters <laughs> too um, but it's a great one. But if the way you tell it, it's Queen Anne had hairy legs, had a crown, a little purple top, and she wore a skirt. It, if you look at the flower underneath it, you'll see little brats. If, to my knowledge, it's the only member of that family that has brats. So if she's wearing a skirt, crown, hairy legs, cannot be poisoned hemlock. Cannot be. So can that be dried for when it's not growing? Yes, you can to dry be used it for teas mm -hmm. when you dry need it. it. Store just store it out of the sunlight. Dry it in the whole form. Throw an oxygen absorber in the thing if you can, and you're good to go. Whole Mama? form is, I'm sorry, whole form is in roots too, or just cut it? No, you can do it from the ground up. Okay. I normally these days just pick the flowers. Okay. Even though that's not the way I started it, one simple reason. Walk through the field and pop, pop, right, pop, right. pop, pop. In two minutes, you're done. Yep. And the flowers work just the same as the leaves do. Or you can do the leaves, either one. Okay. So they're interchangeable for those. Oh, completely. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And you could use the roots if you wanted to, but why when you can just right. pop, 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 exactly. pop, and you're done instead of pulling them up? The, this is a biennial plant. First year is putting out growth, second year it sends wow. for reproduction. So the if you're going to pull the roots to eat them, first year plants, second year they become woody. And you can re-domesticate this back into a care. It'll always be white though. All right, then you got your sweet violets. Some of these leaves will get big, even bigger than this. They can be purplish blue, whitish even. They're still uh, sweet blue violets or sweet violets. The leaves on this are the equivalent of eating spinach. It makes a great mild cooked green. The flowers, syrup, jelly, mm -hmm. wine. The flowers were traditionally used to strengthen the body to fight cancer. The leaves are also have more vitamin C than an orange. Mm. <coughs> and they can, can, and the reason I'm hacking is not allergies. I mowed a patch of poison ivy the other day, <coughs> and that's just got my lungs irritated. Anywho, uh, and they contain a chemical called rutin, R-U-T-I-N, very good for broken capillaries, spider veins, etc. Strengthening. Oh, no, I needed to know that. Very high in rutin. You said the leaves. <laughs> huh? You said the leaves for the. The leaves, yeah, for the vitamin C and the rutin. What about the tubers? Um, they don't have tubers; they have rhizomes. The rhizomes. And the rhizomes, a small piece of the rhizome, about that much, chew it and swallow the juice will stop heartburn in a heartbeat. So the bigger piece will make you throw up. <laughs> so always internally for the capillaries and no, there are, there are some external uses. White oak bark externally too and internally. Mm -hmm. Oh, it is on a honeysuckle bush. <laughs> all of them, by the way, is that all, all honeysuckles. If it's a true lanicera. <laughs> Then they're antiviral. Doesn't have to be just Some of them are extremely invasive too, like some of these bush honeysuckles. Oh, you know about hostas? They're edible. They're Grown in Japan as an edible, not an ornamental, typically. And you can use any of them, especially the young shoots coming up are really, really good. 
What about when they're like this? Ooh. You can still cook them, you need them. They're just, they're just tougher, you just gotta cook them longer. But yeah, we grow them as a flower, they grow them as a vegetable. Do you like pressure cook them too? When they're bigger, I do. Mm -hmm. Here's a good question. Have you ever heard the devil lie? Yes. If you get on Facebook, on YouTube, <laughs> you see this video where the guy says, some people say that wild lettuce is the same thing as morphine. This is good. That's a lie from the devil. <laughs> now, he's saying it by saying some people say, so he can say, I didn't say it. Yeah, I'm just repeating what some people say. Have you ever heard it? It's as good as morphine in the uh -huh. Best pain relief? Really? Yeah. That is. Hokum hokum. It is not. It's not even related to opium mm -hmm. poppies. It is not a major pain reliever. It's a mild pain reliever. It's like taking an aspirin. Now, of course, some people take an aspirin, like, you know, type thing, but no. What happened in the 1800s? This was called vegetable opium. Trade name, the proper name was lactucarium, as in lactuca lettuce. And if you take these, when they, especially as they get bigger, break it, score it, pull the leaf off, you're going to see, uh, depending on the species, a white to yellowish milky latex, and or a clear one, actually. All of them work. It doesn't matter which wild lettuce you use. And you take those and they will dry and become what are called concretions. And they will turn brownish black and they look like black tar opium. Hence the name opium lettuce. Now, it is very, very good for sleep. It is no, not, I wouldn't even put it in my top 100 for pain of herbs. But it's very good for sleep, very good for coughs, common coughs down. How would you use it for sleep? Uh, several ways. I can give you umpteen ways to process this, but generally speaking, you take minus the dirt and the root. Big double handful of this, throw it in a quart of water, simmer it, you know, bring it to a boil, then drop to a simmer, barely bubbling, about 20 minutes. About an hour before bedtime, take a tablespoon. It will not taste like soda pop, as they say. If you're still not sleepy in another hour right before you go to bed, take another one. For me, it's take it, wake up in the morning. In my mind, I don't shut off. I'm waking up and they're like, oh, I got an idea, you know, squirrel. And with this, or Amanita, it's like, good night, I see you in the morning, type thing. And it doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. Um, you can also take this and make uh, semi-dried and dried extracts, and that's where you take a boatload. So like I say, I clean the truck out once a year to get yellow dog, clean it out one more time to get this, and I fill the truck bed full. Go back home, get a big chicken pot on the propane burner, just pile it in, boil it till it gets real, because it'll get really dark looking. Take the lettuce out, press it, take that juice, put it back in the pot, add fresh. Press, fresh, 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 fresh. And when all that's done, then you boil it down till you get down about so low in the pot and it'll start to thicken. And then you sit and you do the border collie stare. Because if you blink, it's gonna go from that to molasses consistency, to concrete consistency, and you'll never get it out of your pot without gas. So you gotta watch it, and you get it down to where it's really, really thick, then you can either put it in the sun in a, uh, a uh, silicone container, or put it in a dehydrator, and leave the, leave the front off, and dehydrate it down to a dried extract, or if you got a, a freeze dryer, freeze dryer that comes out, looks just like Folgers coffee crystals. And it is really concentrated, or you can take a make tinctures with the, the product. It uh, works really good. Do you ever dry those leaves? Is that worthwhile? Uh, yes, I have on occasion. You can, because in the wintertime you won't have this. Most of the year it's, it's available. Um, typically, I keep a ton of it either dehydrated or freeze dried. Do you use it while it's young or? And you can or use it while it's young, but it's most potent as it's getting ready to go into bloom. Okay. And what's interesting is that the actual lettuce used in commerce for this back in the 1800s was garden lettuce. It was not wild lettuces. They, it, they knew it was used for that, and they would occasionally, but most of it was cultivated uh, garden lettuce, and they would let it bolt, 
and then they would do it. And you could do it several ways. One way to do it is you take the top, snip. It'll ooze it out. You scrape it, snip I've again, so it can before. keep bleeding, snip, 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 That's all the way down. It's tedious. It's a little tedious. A lot easier to just take it, boil it, press it. Yeah. And there's a book out there that says it's not water soluble. You can't do it that way. You know, I bet you bumblebees can't fly either. <laughs> But yeah, any, and any of the wild lettuces work. And there's one actually called poison lettuce. And it's not poisonous, it's just strong. Interesting, these are all daffodils. daffodils. Are y'all familiar with what people call uh, uh, snowdrops? Mm -hmm. Have the little, little bell shaped white flowers, has a bulb. From a distance, you might think it's a daffodil, and they're actually related. Uh, the snowdrops. Uh, the one main one used is, is um, produces a chemical called galanthamine or galantamine. All of these daffodils will too. It's very toxic. You got to know what you're doing to use it. Um, but it is the only drug known to reverse the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's made synthesized off the bulbs now. Can you spell galanthamine? G A L A N. T H A M I N E. Okay, for once. One it's, also, correct. it's also pronounced and spelled galantamine without the H. Then there's another one, a, fall, a summer snowdrop or something, that's in a different family, Luke or something or another, that, and I've got some of it growing, and it works pretty much the same. The, same. And the way you tell the difference is galanthamines, those snowdrops, little bell shaped flowers, and then the tips are green. It's mm -hmm. a V shape. Right. It? Of course, the other one is just a blobby green. Okay. Oh, no difference in the thing. And daffodils, too. Got to know what you're doing, but uh, very, very effective for reversing signs and symptoms of both dementia and Alzheimer's. And this is modern studies. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's actually being pro the there's drug, there's the drug, there's, drug, there's actually now. a drug produced and prescribed. Okay. Do you have any of that? Do I have any? Did you say it was synthesized from the bulb? I think I don't think they're using the raw ingredient anymore for the straight medicine. I think they synthesize the medication just because it's cheaper. How do you get the raw raw ingredient? You dig it up. And it's got a bulb. How much do you use? I ain't gonna tell you. Um, say Carolina jasmine. It's done in the dosing on it is done in one third of a drop per milliliter of your formula. But you do it as a one to ten or one to twenty extract, as opposed to a one to two or a one to five, because it's so potent. This is Solomon seal. Solomon seal. What kind of Solomon seal? Variegated. Obviously, it's variegated. <laughs> Pretty good guess. Uh, it's a cultivar out of Japan. You can use this the same way you use regular Solomon seal. The benefit to this, if there's a benefit, is that it doesn't care about the heat and the sunshine. So you can grow it a lot more out in the open than you do the regular Solomon seal. If you go through the the big city of Mentone, downtown, past the flashing light like you're going down the mountain valley head, about 200 yards down, look to your left, there's a massive amount of Solomon seal out on the side of the highway. Uh, you have to walk down to get to it because uh, there's no pull out there. <laughs> But it's a lot of salmon. So salmon seal, salmon seal here is common. They're, every one of these hollows has a ton of salmon seal. That one works just as good. No, as the no other difference. Um, salmon seal gained yeah. fame from what? I think it was either Gerard or I can't remember who one of his contemporaries said it was for strong-willed women who ran into their husbands' fists. Oh, okay. Bruising. Bruising. Got got cold cough, got bruised. But it actually gained its real fame in the treatment of post-delivery. For when women's pelvic cavities were stretched out, it stretched those tendons and ligaments, and this tightens them and heals them and brings them back into position. Extrapolate that on out. AC joints, meniscus tears, sprained ankles, anything dealing with tendons and ligaments, and I actually like it for muscle tears, people with muscle tears too. And you use the root, right? The root's the only part you use. It's, it's actually a rhizome. You all know, take me, you know the difference between a rhizome and a root? The rhizome's the big part. The roots are the little pieces coming off. And you use that whole thing, you can make a tincture or an oil. Either, really, I'll tell you why 
why you would do either one, but the tincture actually is an oily, slimy tincture. And the oil is an oily, oily tincture. Yeah. Or, technically, it is a tincture. If you rub it on and take it internally, and you can do the oil internally too, it not only heals the tear, it helps with pain, especially if you use it topically. Very, very good for that. And the, the rhizomes and roots are edible, by the way. What was your question? Is it used the same way yes. as the other one? Yes. Because that I can get everywhere, but okay. the other one I can't. All right. And you got here what? Good boy. Plantain. Which plantain? Frog. Frog. Nope. Oh. Um. Huh? Is it like a root or something? Plantain. Red bean. All right. How many of you have heard the story that Indians call plantain white man's footsteps? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes you think that it, there was no plantain here. The, tr the story is only got a, ha is a half truth. The English brought over broadleaf plantain, and they brought over which uh, English or lance leaf plantain. We had about 15 plantains already here. This is one of them that looks like broadleaf plantain, but it is Plantago rugelii, and it's a native plantain. It looks like broadleaf plantain on steroids, and. I have seen these twice that size in wet soil. But the way you tell it is if you pull one up or look carefully, the very base where it goes into the ground is going to be burgundy red. Broadleaf plantain is going to be a greenish white. And the leaves are even though they're similarly shaped or smaller. Tweedledee, tweedledum doesn't matter. They work the same. All plantains work the same. If you, as a food, if you take these and boil them for about six, seven, eight minutes, they'll turn real thin and translucent, and you can make sushi wrappers with them, sort of like stuffed grape leaves. They contain a chemical called allantoin, as in comfrey. So you can use them just like you use comfrey for healing wounds and cuts and scrapes and as an emollient for the skin. But you can use that on puncture wounds where you can't use it on... Actually, you can't. Ah, I knew you could say you can use comfrey on puncture wounds what? and deep-seated wounds. It's how you use it. Right. You just don't want it to heal the skin. You don't want it. Heal. People think you just dump the comfrey on it. Now, I've used this fine on plant, on puncture wounds. The reason being because this also has chemicals that deal with the bacteria yes. issue that that comfrey does not. Right. And um, like with comfrey, if you got a deep wound and you want to use it, you start at the base of the wound and heal it, then you work your way up. You don't heal it all at one time. But yeah, this contains a lantern. It's very good as an internal mucilaginous herb for inflamed intestinal tissue. It will neutralize bee venom, insect bites, <coughs> you name it. Excellent. Poison ivy. If you Remember, back in the 1980s, what was the internet called? Huh? Encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. World it, Wide Web. World Wide Web, yeah. There was no internet back then, even when well, Al Gore claimed he invented it. <laughs> no, back in the 1980s, the internet was called The Tonight Show. <laughs> if you got on The Tonight Show, since you had about three channels, everybody knew who you were. Does everybody watch that? Or Lawrence Welk or Hee Haw? Tom Brown got on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and he's talking about Poison Ivy. What did he recommend? Jewelry. So everybody thinks jewelry. It's the cat's me off Poison Ivy. Actually, if you're a pasty skinned white person, jewelry can burn you. My little pasty skinned son, when he was seven, had poison ivy. I put it in, you could see the, the chemical burns from, from the jewelry on that. Oh. This puts jewelry to shame. Mm -hmm. I'm in no comparison. If you're out in the woods and you get into poison ivy, if you're paying attention, it actually burns and stings a little bit. But we, usually we're so busy we never notice it. You crush that on there, rub it on, it'll neutralize it then. If you already have it, this will heal it rapidly. Yes. If it's a bad case, it can take longer. In which case, I also recommend you mix um, in not mix with it, but use uh, white oak tincture. White oak tincture will dry it up, lickety split. 
and this will heal tea. the skin. A strong metal, metal tea, tea is right very up. good for it. Jewelweed is really good for things like stinging metal stings, but and some people love it for poison ivy, but what no comparison. Root wash for poison ivy. What? A a root root wash. wash. Well, you can, and, and it's okay, but for some people, poison uh, poke root is going to light them up, too. When y'all see Rose in there, if you meet Rose, ask her how she likes poison ivy, in, I mean, poke root in the eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. That was a fun class. Anyhow. Plantain helped with capsaicin burn as well. Any kind of burn. Yes, Sunburn. Yes. Habaneros lit me up um, last year, and it works wonderfully. Um, <laughs> oh, it never fits. If I work with hot peppers, I'm going to pick something or scratch something. Yeah, you know, I got it on my face. Yeah. You, know, you think you've washed it away. Um, you can take and make ice cubes out of this. Just blend them up, swoosh them up, freeze it, and put that on poison ivy or burns. Wonderful, wonderful. If you're old enough and admit the truth, you've used the seeds for this Metamucil. Uh, uh, the big medicinal benefit besides poison ivy is that it is a biofilm buster. It, in, it does two things. It is not an antibiotic, but if you're using an antibiotic herb such as yellow root, uh, blackberry, which a lot of people don't realize is an antibiotic, southern white oak, another antibiotic that is going to kill bacteria, this inhibits the ability of those bacteria to produce biofilm to protect themselves. It also interferes with their ability to communicate and say, hey, we're under attack, produce biofilm. And so then the antibiotic herbs can go in there or the antimicrobial herbs you use can go in there and actually attack and kill the bacteria. And it is great as an addition. Anytime you use a, an antibiotic, if you can, I'd add plantain to the, to the formula. If you know the reason then to act on that biofilm. And it also works to weaken viruses when you're doing antiviral herbs as well. So like with Lyme, where they're known to have like that crazy strong yes, biofilm? Yes. Thing. You know, I work a lot with Lyme and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Alpha Gal and all that. And it is so much more complex than here, take this herb. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, point center, if somebody says I can cure your Lyme disease in six months of Lyme, or just convince themselves that they can and they can't. It's, it's a lifelong battle treatable but it's a lifelong battle. I have taken plantain seeds and I've infused them in coconut oil mm -hmm. and rubbed them on me and they're a great mosquito repellent. It's a you just crush the leaves and do that. It's it's excellent. It's um and I don't know of any particular chemical in it that's doing it, but it does it. And um uh, you can put in tick repellents. Um you know, beautyberry and, and summer seed are the best, but I mean, it's great in tick repellents. And, you know, the, it, it goes back to the thing of not every plant's had a double blind placebo controlled study. Well, that doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it hadn't had a double blind placebo controlled study and peer review and all that. But, it, but anecdotally, if you look at things, if they've been used for a thousand years, consistently for the same condition, there must be a good reason. It's like Tommy Bass was telling me, he said, I said, well, Tommy, you've told me X herb, it's got boom. You, you know, there's hundred herbs that are good for this. Well, which one? He said, well, we had to, depending on the person, find this herb that worked because if we did not find the herb that worked, we'd be sick or die. So we had motivation to find what worked and they used it consistently. He didn't know a botanical name till the day he died, but he did this for 81 years from the, from a time and day of where his first teacher was born a slave to the point where when he died, the space shuttle was flying. And he used those same herbs consistently and you saw results. Didn't have double blind placebo control. Who cares? I, I work a lot with people with animals. You can't do do voodoo, you know, placebo a dog. They don't know. Well, I don't know. I got border collies. They might figure it out. But, um, <laughs> but otherwise, you know, you go by what works. And there's some of the old stuff that just really didn't hold water, but most of it actually, when it was used consistently, did. Or valid. If you get, it's like I said in this morning cooking. If you get a, I think I did, yeah. If you get a, a wild food book, 90% of the foods in there that you gather 
per nibble. So you'll spend a thousand calories to get 50. If you get a plant book from wild medicine, you're going to see, let's say, garlic. They'll give you 500 uses. Well, you know, some of them may have used it, uh, but there's about five or six that it really specifically is chemically active for. 